Hey everyone, let's get started on part two of planting and growing fruiting plum trees. We ended part one at disease and insect pressure of plum trees in your area. If you are growing organically, disease resistant trees are the best choice, but more on this later in another video. For now, call your cooperative extension at your state university to find out what disease and insects are prevalent in your area for your plum tree. Here in zone 7, a temperate zone 7, there's armillaria root rot that you'll see pictured here. That's going underneath the soil. It's white mycelium that you'll see on the root and also under the bark, like in this picture. And the mushrooms that grow from the tree. Another common disease is black knot. Here it is on the trunk. But more likely, if you catch it soon enough, it'll be just on the branches like this. Brown rot is next and is extremely common in a humid environment and in zone 7. It will destroy the fruit and can affect other parts of the tree as well. As with most disease, it thrives in wet, humid weather. Coming up is a photo of Cytospora canker on a plum tree. Leaf spot can be caused by bacteria, virus, or fungus. Here's a pic of one of them. There's more. Bacterial canker, scale, verticillium wilt, corinium blight, ring spot, leaf curl, blotch, and the next four are less common on plum trees. Plum pox, plum pocket, phytophora, root rot, and anthracnose. I almost forgot crown rot and powdery mildew. And if you're in the UK, silver leaf. Now let's go over insects. Here in temperate zone 7, we have the plum curculio coming up next. It lays an egg in the fruit, the larva hatch, and dig through. There's a crescent shaped bite mark. There it is when it's very young, when your fruit's very young, but it'll get on older fruit too. The oriental fruit moth is another common pest here. And just like the plum curculio, it lays an egg, the larvae eat away at your fruit. Like the plum curculio, it leaves behind a gummy substance on your fruit. Next up is the tree borer that gets in the base of your tree, the root line, the first foot of your tree at the bottom, or the crotches of your branches. The larvae look like this. Don't confuse tree borers with fruit borers like the plum cuculio. Next up is the Japanese beetle, which is very, very common in the south. A few more include tarnished plant bug, leaf roller aphids, stink bugs, green fruit worm, codling moth, cherry fruit fly mites, rose chafer, leaf hopper, thrips or thripes, and um, well, there's a few more, but that'll do. Now don't be discouraged, there's hope. Because of these diseases and pests, organic growers should purchase tree cultivars that are resistant to common diseases and common pests in your area. Also try to get uh, cultivars that their fruit doesn't crack from heavy rains or other reasons because that'll help them from getting a disease. From experience here in Temperate Zone 7, I can tell you that brown rot, bacterial leaf spot, thrips, Japanese beetles, and tree borers, and plump curculio are present here. Control of these diseases and pests will be in another video. I will also include named cultivars that are disease resistant. There are some things I can go over quickly now. They include plant your tree properly, keep your tree healthy, water well, and keep the grasses and weeds at bay at least a foot past the drip line. Remove disease, dead, and damaged limbs as soon as possible. Clean up fallen debris from around the tree. That's about it on that. Briefly, let's talk about rootstock. Rootstocks are important for resistance to some pests like nematodes, for soil tolerance of a certain soil like sand or clay, and for tree size, dwarf, semi-dwarf, or standard. Most backyard growers choose a dwarf or semi-dwarf tree. Semi-dwarf trees usually do better and are better anchored. And with pruning, a semi-dwarf tree can be kept quite small. More on rootstocks in a later film. But I can tell you now 
that buying from a reputable online seller that has disease-resistant trees on a named rootstock that have a guarantee are usually your best option. Dormant bare root trees planted in the spring or the fall are best. They should be no less than 5 8 inch diameter and no more than 1 inch, preferably grafted to a 2 year old rootstock. Stay away from big box stores. There's usually several reasons for this. First, you may not get the cultivar you want. Second, they usually do not carry disease resistant varieties or varieties that do well in your area. They carry the stuff people have heard of before. Third, you have no idea what rootstock the tree is grafted to. Fourth, the tree is potted and probably root bound with thin, weak roots. And that's bad news for people who have heavy clay. Fifth, the tree or soil mix may have come from another country or another state harboring disease and insects that are not currently in your country or your state. This consideration is a serious concern. Think Dutch elm disease, emerald ash borer, Japanese beetle, and most of the fruit tree diseases that we have today. The list goes on. Sixth, if you're an American, buy American. Vote with your dollars. Many tree nurseries, even online nurseries, grow their own stock. Check it out before you buy. A few facts before I explain how to plant a plum tree step by step. Fruit trees generally do not grow true from seed because most are crosses. The very nature of cross-pollination ensures diversity of fruit crops. If you want the same fruit, take a cutting and graft it. What's the lifespan of a European plum tree? 30 to 50 years. When I was a little girl, we had a 40-year-old Stanley. It was still fruiting, although its vigor was declining. Now, Japanese plums are a different story. You can cut their lifespan by half or less. What's the rate of growth? How fast will my European plum tree grow? Fast. It will grow four to eight feet the first year, including scaffold branches. Japanese plums grow fast too. How many years to bear fruit, you ask? You may get flowers the first or second year after planting a bare root tree. But I highly recommend pulling them off the first and second year. This practice will speed your tree's growth and its root system. Besides, you wouldn't want the weight of the fruit to bend your scaffolds permanently, deforming your tree. Or worse, breaking the precious scaffolds. Fruit trees break easily. You will get a lot of fruit from your plum tree the season of its third birthday in the ground. These you keep so you can chow down. So if you plant it in spring of 2019, you will harvest a good quantity of fruit in 2022. This goes for Japanese plums as well. If you have a great deal of fruit, especially on the branch tips, I would suggest thinning these or removing them entirely. On the Stanley and many other plum cultivars, most of your fruit will be coming from spurs directly off the scaffolds first, then the laterals. Do not remove these, thinking you're pruning suckers. These will bear your fruit as the years tick by. Later, I will make a video about pruning plum trees and the other stone fruits. How about yield? How many pounds of plums will I get? Well, that depends on the size of the tree. Mature dwarf, one to two bushels. Mature standard, three to six bushels. The Japanese plum trees will give you less, approximately one half to two bushels and two to four bushels on the standard tree. That's it for today. I'll finish this mini series in my next plum video. Subscribe and click the bell icon so that I can post longer videos. I need 1,000 subscribers to do so. As always, if I forget anything, I will add it below. Don't forget to watch part one and part three with the links below. Visit my website at growhealthtv.com. Buy a cool t-shirt or CBD oil and support my channel for more content. They come in many styles and colors. Get yours now. Like, share, and subscribe, and comment too.